In dying, Christ destroyed our death. In rising, Christ restored our life. And Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Donald Graham Hess put on Christ. So in Christ may dawn now be clothed in glory. Here and now, dear friends, know that we are children of God, that we shall, what we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and those who have this hope purify themselves just as Christ is pure. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, or height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love we have in God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Friends, we are gathered here today to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life and eternal life of Don Hess. We come together today with our grief and acknowledgement of our human loss. So today, may God grant us grace that in this pain, we will find comfort. In this sorrow, we will find hope. And in death, testify to the glory of resurrection. Our first hymn is, It Is Well With My Soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my And Lord, haste the day when the face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so it is well with my soul. It is well with 
with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. Let us pray. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready than we are to hear us pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death. Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading for today is Psalm 23. Would you please join me in reading it as it is found printed in your bulletins? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness. For his name's sake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our New Testament lesson today was picked as a passage of importance to Don because it's the passage held to by Stephen Ministers. Don, as you will hear, was passionate about Stephen Ministry. So as you hear these words, may you know how precious they were to him. A reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In lieu of one homily or eulogy, the family has decided that we will hear three witnesses from people who knew and loved Don deeply. First, we will hear from Mrs. Jo Mangum, a witness to Don's history and life. Then we will hear from Mrs. Molly Beck, our Minister of Pastoral Care here at Millbrook, as she witnesses to Don's ministry and faith. And finally, we will hear from Reverend Michael Barlow, a witness to Don's final days and his lasting legacy. Joe, would you please come forward? Hello, my name is Joanne Dobbins Mangle. And I am the person who Don called his little sister, not by blood, but by history. You see, my very first memory was sitting on the end of my sister's bed watching her take up strands of hair and teasing them. Then she would take Aquanet. How many people know what Aquanet is? Okay. 
Then she would take Aquanet and she would spray. And she meticulously did this with every strand of hair until she could mold it into can only be called a bouffant hairdo with a little flip on the end and then a pink bow on the side as if that hair was going to move, <laughs> right? Like she needed to keep it. All of this was done. The hair, the makeup, the perfect outfit was done for this skinny little boy called Don Hess. He was teeny, he was skinny. Jimmy, you remember how skinny he used to be? And he drove this really cool car. And my sister was over the hills in love with him. And he was over the moon in love with her. And they were secretly engaged. Now, all great loves have challenges, right? And here was the first one. She was 16. He was 19. There is no possibility my parents were going to allow them to get married. And the other challenge was this. Don didn't understand yet because Vanita had been on her best behavior. But she, he was going to marry a Dobbins girl, which is synonymous with Hellcat. But you know what? He, that did not stop him. Because here's the thing you need to know about Don. And you probably all do know about Don. It's once he made a decision, he was steadfast in that decision. And he had decided he was marrying Vanita. And he was steadfast. Now, this secret engagement was revealed. And it was revealed by a precocious four-year-old, me, who went through her room and found a diamond ring under her pillow and took it to Mama and said, what's that? It was a problem. Mom and Daddy tried to immediately make them break up. Oh, they were not going to have it. So Mom and Dad, they hatched a plan. And the plan was this. They were going to say that what they said was, if she will finish high school and two years of college and get her associate degree, then we will not stand in the way. We will throw you a wedding. Now, they were very confident in their plan, and their plan was this. There is no way young love is going to survive four years, and particularly no way it was going to survive her going to college. He was going to find another girl, or he, she was going to find another boy. But, oh, guess what? They didn't understand Don. Don had decided that's who he was going to marry, and guess what? He was steadfast in that commitment. So the waiting began. The waiting began, and it was good for them. They needed that time for their relationship to bloom. And Don needed some time to understand how to wrangle this Dobbins girl. She was smart and wily. He was smart and scrappy. And he used to do things to get her to do the things he wanted her to do. Let me give you an example. She refused to learn how to drive his manual transmission car. She said, I don't need to drive. I feel like a lady when you drive me around. So Don hatched a plan. He went parking. Now, for those of you who were too young to know what parking is, Parking is when you drive your girlfriend out to a desolate area and you do things that your parents would not approve of. And that's what they did. And then before, as they needed to go, because she had a 9 p.m. curfew, on their way back, or she said, I need to get home. I need to get home for my curfew. And he said, here's the deal. The only way you're getting home for your curfew is if you drive. 
So here were her choices. She was late for curfew or she had to drive. Well, remember, she's scrappy. She said, okay, I'll drive your car home. And she did all the way in first gear. <laughs> she did. He used to love telling that story. But you know, she did finish high school. She did finish college. And he was waiting for her. He was. He was waiting for her. And they got married August 6th, 1967. Right here. Right here. And you know what? They started this adventure of marriage. But before I go on, I need to have a little inter a, a little side note. While we were going through Don's stuff, we found this. This, you may not recognize, is a health card. Now, in 1967, when you got married, you had to prove you did not have VD to get a marriage license. You did. You had to get issued. They're going, what's VD? I can, I can see <laughs> I can see him saying that. What's that? So you had to have that. And you had to present this card to get a marriage license. This is Don's card. Now, Heather nor I understand this card. You may see that there's writing on the back. Do you remember when, in, when we were children and we did something wrong in school and we would have to write on the board, I promise not to chew gum in class, I promise not to chew gum in class. Some of you are too young to remember that tradition. Something similar is on the back of this. It says, Vanita Dobbins is sorry. She hit Don Hess in the face. <laughs> Intentionally or playfully. Benita Dobbins is sorry. <laughs> there it is, three times on the back of his medical card. Heather and I so wish we understood the story behind this, but we don't. We don't understand this story. Marriage was mumpy in the beginning. Mama and Daddy moved within the week of them getting married. The whole family moved 250 miles away, leaving her alone in Raleigh. The race riots broke out, and Don was called up from his National Guard position. She was by herself in a little one-bedroom. We called it the shotgun house and five points. She was scared. She was 19 years old, and she slept with a knife under her pillow. But things settled down. And come to find out, Mama was wrong. He really did have ambition. He did. <laughs> he had ambition. He, was a he had been a butcher at Winn-Dixie. And then what happened was he got accepted into the management program of ITT Continental Baking, who owned Wonder Bread and Hostess. And he started up this management path. They moved a lot. They moved once a year for 10 years to different states. And then finally, he was appointed over all of the Northeast region of Continental Bakeries. It was the life they hoped for. Big house, nice cars. They spent the weekends in the city going to Broadway shows and eating at restaurants. It was a lot of work. He left every Sunday to travel and came home on Friday. But he said, that's the sacrifice that we give for ambition. Then Heather came along and it got harder. And so he tells the story of packing his suitcase and going to the front door to leave on Sunday and her running up and going, thanks for stopping by. <laughs> And he said, oh, no, I don't think this is worth it anymore. And he decided right there, I'm quitting. I'm leaving. I'm making a commitment to my daughter. Now, Vanita did not agree. 
Veneta did not agree at all, but ultimately they did agree that he would take over his father's business, Wilson's Outdoor Equipment, and they would move back to Raleigh. He sold or, tra or gave away his fine three-piece suits, and he started wearing a shirt that had Don on it. He sold his BMW, and he bought himself a Jeep. Now, don't misunderstand, he still liked good cars, and for some reason, he always liked cars that made noise, lots of noise. I never have figured that quite out, but he did. But he changed his path with all of that. Over the next decades, few decades, he had a beautiful life. He built a business, he grew his family, he sat out during the weekend and listened to obnoxiously loud music while NASCAR was on the, the television. He loved cooking a pig. He had bowls of candy all around him. I never really understood why, but there were all these bowls of candy around him. All the family gatherings, we were at his house and beer and the cooker were involved. He and Benita loved the beach and they ultimately bought a condo on beachfront. He also loved to fish. And he had a best friend, Bud. They were bonded because they had married two Dobbin sisters. Ann had two Dobbin's daughters, six weeks apart. That was a bond that nobody else understood, but those two men, and they were, as mama used to say, attached at the hip. One had on flannel, the other one had on flannel. They did, that's how they rolled. He also had, oh, by the way, we referred to those two men as the outlaws. That's what we referred to them as. He also had this amazing memory. And every time we went on family vacations, we would start with a piece of paper and we would put it on the refrigerator and we would track the dirty jokes that he told during the vacation. And I honestly, I started trying to remember some of the jokes because I was going to tell one of them here, but I couldn't find one I could tell here. So I'm skipping that, but I'm <laughs> just saying. But the bad side of his memory is he remembered everything somebody did, good or bad. He did. But you know what? If he loved you, he didn't matter. He was steadfast to you anyway. His steadfastness really shined when, Therese, when Vanita got sick. It was a hard journey. She was terminally ill. And, you know, it was made harder by the fact that she was not a great patient. Every time he gave her medicine, she would have a line of cuss words coming out. Now, for those of you who know, she didn't have a voice any longer, but you could see her mouth moving with the cuss words. And then she would give him not one middle finger, but two middle fingers. And the whole time he chuckled and spoke to her softly. That's who he was. Now, have you noticed there's a word I keep using over and over? Steadfast. He was steadfast. As I looked over the back over his life, I thought, you know, that's the word that describes him. He loved what he loved. He stayed true to what he loved, and he stayed true to who he loved. He wasn't flashy. He was defined by loyalty and always being where he was needed. This steadfastness built my sister's life. It made her life great. This steadfastness built Heather. It made her life great. And that steadfastness is a legacy to her children who will benefit from him and all of our family and all of you were built by that steadfastness. For that and more, we are grateful.
when I think of Don, I remember his deep and ab abiding sadness in watching Vanita struggle and die. I also remember his determination to move forward. Following her death in 2011, he attended a 13-week grief share class at Crossroads Fellowship and longed for more connection and more support. Millbrook offered our first grief class on Sunday afternoons from the 1st of July, 2012 until the middle of August. In that class, Don met MB Bryant Hudson and Nancy Hudson, who were grieving the loss of their adult daughter and remembering a toddler daughter lost many years ago whose death weighed heavy on their hearts. I encouraged participants to bring a photo and talk about the persons they were mourning. Don brought a wedding photo of a radiant young bride and her beaming husband walking out those very steps that many of you came in today. He sat and held the picture for many moments, shaking his head, unable to speak. After that session ended in August, we offered it again as part of our Wednesday night dinners and classes. Of course, offering dinners is very attractive to a lot of people, especially Don and me, and even Heather and the children came to some of those dinners. He jokingly told his new classmates that he had to retake the course because he flunked the first one. Yet once when I had to be away, he led the class. At the end, he said, the hole in my heart is still there, but the edges are becoming less jagged. What a vivid description of how Vanita's death affected him and how he was beginning to find a sense of healing. I have used his words many times in helping others hold on to hope. One of my primary responsibilities here at Millbrook is recruiting, training, and guiding our Stephen ministers. Stephen ministry trains lay people to give one-to-one -one confidential listening care to others who need a Christian friend. Having seen Don's gifts of empathy and compassion, I invited him to apply for our first Stephen ministry training class. On his application, dated July 27, 2013, he responded to this prompt, describe your relationship with Jesus Christ. He wrote, the loss of my wife through cancer brought me back to the church. Prior to that, I felt that I could do it on my own. I now realize I can't do it without God in my life. I have a lot to learn, but I'm, going to, I'm doing those things that will bring me closer to God. Intense weekly training for two and a half hours each week began in September 2013. I don't think he missed a class throughout the 27 weeks of training. Sometimes he came in a little sweaty from working in a building without air conditioning, but he was fully present. He was one of nine in that first training class, and I see at least two more out here today paying honor to him. After commissioning as a Stephen minister, there is continuing education and peer group supervision twice a month. Don roared up to every meeting in the Mustang until his mobility began to falter. At the end of 2014, Don accepted his first and only Stephen ministry care receiver. He met weekly with this intriguing man for several years. When he gave his report to the peers in his supervision group, his concern for his care receiver was real and deep. Then the man's mental health diminished so much that visits were no longer fruitful. Don was reluctant to end the long-standing relationship. More recently, beginning in February 2019, Don joined a group again with MB, and Bob and Fred, three other grieving widowers in a group facilitated by a man whose wife is living with Alzheimer's disease. Meeting monthly over a bag lunch, they shared their struggles and joys, memories and lost hopes for their golden years. 
Six months later, when the group meetings ended, Don continued his friendship with MB and Bob and Fred. They would meet for breakfast every Saturday morning at a local restaurant. When Don was no longer driving, they would pick him up from the lodge at Wake Forest for Saturday mornings out. Heather said that whenever Don faced a change in his living situation, had to move to a different facility, he would always confirm that his church friends would still be able to visit. I think it was those breakfast outings that he was hoping for, not so much the visits. The two widowers who remain care deeply for each other and cherish their time together. They're missing their two grief buddies who are now reunited with their wives in heaven. It's often said, the deeper the love, the deeper the grief. In the grief class, we talked about the importance of expressing emotions. Don said that hearing the words of John 11:35, Jesus wept, gave him the freedom to weep over his great loss. This dedicated and successful and steadfast business owner was not afraid to let his tears flow. Stephen ministry is grounded in several scriptures. One of them is Galatians 6, 2. Bear one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Don Hess lived a life of faith that he may not have been able to articulate. But those whom he encountered were richly blessed in knowing him, and they saw the love of Christ lived out in him. I find comfort knowing that Don's tears have been wiped away by the God who created him and has loved him forever. There is no mourning and no pain, only rejoicing in the presence of Jesus. Good afternoon. I am uh, Michael Barlow, as you heard. I get to take this off, praise Jesus. Uh, as you heard, uh, I get the privilege of standing and speaking on his life from a, a, a unique perspective. I'm not only uh, his son in law, I also am a pastor. So I've had uh, many conversations. In fact, our relationship really is based upon those conversations. Um, over the past couple of years that Heather and I have been married, um, Don and I really shared a, a special connection uh, through the, the loss of our, our wives and the mutual love for his daughter and his grandchildren. And of course, his love for uh, his church. Heather has asked if I would come today and speak some on his later moments in life, specifically the last 48 hours. And it is an honor and a privilege to be here. I thank you so much, uh, Pastor Christy, Pastor Grayson, Molly. Uh, thank you all so much for allowing us to be here to do this. Um, Aunt Joe, uh, beautiful. As always, it is an honor to be a part of this service and to help to tell the story of Don's legacy. It is a privilege to have had a front row seat in watching you to take the two greatest commandments to love God and to love others and to weave them with respecting and honoring your father the way you did. The way that you sacrificed and loved him, you did it so beautifully and so well. Thank you for teaching me for our family, teaching our family and those that were watching what it looks like to love and to be the hands of Christ. I first, oh. so my purpose today is to recall for you uh, some of the recent moments in Don's life through conversations that we had 
to kind of give you a 30,000 foot view of into Don's heart through those. And then to, in the end, intimately invite you into our last and most important conversation that we had in this life. So with that, I say yes to Heather's requests and I pray that everything I say today brings honor to Don and to glory to God. So first I wanna acknowledge the obvious. I think we would all agree Don left us way too soon on July 29th. He leaves behind a family of friends, family and friends and church family that both love and miss him greatly. As you've heard, he also leaves more behind in the fact that he leaves a life of service. As a husband to Vanita, whether it's morning cups of coffee or cared for her physically into the moments of death, whether it was as a father, as he was always there showing up when uh, Heather needed her daddy or making him smile with the ultimate dad jokes, as we all know so well as a son, as a brother, as an uncle, grandfather, and even great grandfather, as Aunt Jo said, steadfast, rock solid, he was stable. The church family would agree as a, as a member of the body, he gave of his time, his talents, his treasures, he leveraged his suffering to serve others that were hurting. As a soldier in the National Guard, he made sacrifices for peace. As friends and neighbors, he served his community and he never knew a stranger, he only knew new friends. So when you combine all of these things together, the love of people and a strong worth ethic, it will absolutely create a life of service. And Don Hess had a heart to serve others. But Don now leaves something even more behind, and that is a legacy. And he leaves a legacy of hope. As his son-in-law, we talked about many different things. We talked about the glories of stock car racing, uh, we had rival racing heroes. Obviously, if you knew Don, you knew he was a fan of Dale Earnhardt. That was not me. I was a Tim Richmond fan. And uh, so we didn't see eye to eye on that, but we did see eye to eye on the fact that it was an amazing way to spend multiple hours watching cars go around in a circle. We also shared a love of cars, whether it was muscle cars from the 60s or 70s that he knew way more intimate than I did, or sports cars from the 80s or 90s or modern, uh, modern day hot rods like his ruby red Mustang GT, or my scheduled midlife crisis car, which will be a victory red Pontiac Trans Am. We talked about these things and embraced these things uh, as passions and loves. As a pastor son-in-law, we talked about much deeper things and that was the things of God. We would have conversations about God's love, his mercy, his forgiveness, his grace. We would talk about his church, family, the people, the ministry that he loved so dearly, the pastors that he loved so dearly. We would share stories. I, he would always ask about my story, my calling to prepare and to pastor. He was intrigued by the fact that somebody would put themselves through Hebrew and Greek and things like that for, for the sake of ministry. But he respected and he loved and he always wanted to hear stories. And of course, it always would come back to the Bible, which is God's one redemptive story. But there was a common theme to our conversations and that was always around discussions of acts of service. There was a, a lack of assurance seemingly in these ideas that service was something more than just serving. He would always end these conversations, though, in some sort of humorous way where he was confused or or maybe convicted of something that he was wrestling with. There was always something that he would just end in a, in a humorous way. And this was a reoccurring theme over the past four years. There also seemed to be something that was uh, becoming obvious, and that was his in his uncertainty and his playful dismissal it gave us great concerns for his soul. Whether it's Heather and myself or his brother, Jimmy, who's Don's brother and pastor, uh, a pastor, uh, we talked about our fear of his death that would happen apart from Christ. We prayed that God would be merciful and save him. We continue to speak to him in truth and love in the gospel. My last conversation with Don. I wanna invite you to, to lean in close to this and be a part of it because Tuesday, July 27th, 2021,
while in the Wake Med Hospital, emergency room E59, about 7.30 p.m. The hospice care lady had just finished speaking to him about the next steps, and it was time for his pain medication. And up to this point, he didn't even know I was in the room. He was in a declining state. Cognitively, he wasn't there. Uh, he was struggling to have conversations with hospice care. When she would ask a question, he would pause and he would say, I'm, she said, do you understand? He said, I, I, I think so. I just trying to get my brain to work. I'm trying to get the words out. So up to this point, he, he didn't even know I was there. He was sleeping the whole time. He was unable to open his eyes because of the fall that he had taken. He was struggling to think and understand where he was, what was going on. He was struggling to speak and articulate his thoughts. But something was about to happen. After agreeing to additional pain, man pain management with a soft-spoken yes. Similar to what Don would do, I asked him if he was planning to share. After hearing my voice, everything seemed to change. He opened his eyes, the one that wasn't affected by the fall. He began to speak with clarity. His mind was lucid and awake. He was aware and quick-witted. It was like talking to Don from six months ago. It was sudden and obvious change. Heather and I were taken back by this. It was the answer to our prayers. And now, two quick notes. <laughs> we had been praying for God to bring salvation to our family for years. Not just physical healing, but spiritual healing. Secondly, we, we both knew that it wasn't the sound of my voice that had anything to do with the sudden change, but it was the Spirit of God. Once again, we began to talk about the things of God, but this time it was different. This time I didn't initiate the conversation. This time Don did. Everyone in the room understood the severity of the injuries from the falls. Everybody knew what the hospice care meant. It was comfort care. There was no healing from that. Everybody understood the weight of what was happening. It was the end of life. And Don began to speak of heaven. And he said he didn't know, but he hoped that his bride, Vanita, was already there. And then he said what would characterize all our previous conversations about heaven that he hoped he had done enough good things in this life that God would at least let him in so that he could sweep the floors. He believed he had worked his whole life and he was hoping, he's putting all of his hope in these things that he could go and to be in heaven again in the presence of God to work. Standing beside him, I said, Dad, I love you enough to tell, to tell you that's not how salvation works. It's not about the things that you've done. It's all about resting in what's already been done for you. In Christ, the work has already been done. In Christ, the price of our sin has already been paid. So God's not interested in what we do with our hands until he first has our hearts. Surrender and devotion. It's always about the heart. It's what guides our lives. It's what leads our words, our actions, our worship, our works. It all comes out of that. Don, like so many people, had placed his hope in himself. He had spent his entire life serving others, and he did so joyfully and lovingly. But in his final moments, reflecting back on his life, he now hoped he had done enough good things to make it across the finish line. He hoped that God would be merciful because of what he had done. Not blind faith that saves, but the object of your faith. I said, Dad, it's not about just having faith. It's about the object of your faith. I said, every time you sit in a chair and everyone that sat in these pews, unless you tested it, you did so, you sat having faith that it would hold you. But the difference is, in that exhibit of faith, those pews, those chairs were only designed to support your body. The chair can't save your eternal soul. The perfect example I pointed him to was the only one that was sufficient for salvation.
the one that left heaven, came down to us for the purpose of salvation. He was, he was born to die in our place. He was the only perfect sacrifice and no one else could do what was necessary. Our best was filthy rags before a holy God. It was insufficient for salvation. Imagine working and hoping your entire life only to discover that it was not good enough, that it was never supposed to be. The Apostle Paul writes in Ephesians 2, 4 through 10, For you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Don was doing exactly what he was created to do. He was serving. He was loving. He was doing what he was created for, to serve others. He just hadn't yet figured out why behind it. Scripture teaches us, though, that in Christ we are not measured by what we do. It's not about our works. We are measured by what Christ has already done. It's Jesus in my place. It's his sacrifice. The work has already been done in the death and sacrifice of Christ. The cross, Jesus says, it is finished. John 19, 30, meaning specifically everything necessary for salvation is complete. Nothing else needs to be done. Our hope can rest in the finished work of Christ. Our works are an overflow of our grateful hearts. I I began recalling a familiar Bible story to Don. I said, Dad, do you remember the story of Jesus walking with his disciples and teaching them who he was? Mark 8, 27 through 29. Jesus went out to his disciples in the village of Caesarea Philippi. And on the road, he asked his disciples, who do people say I am? They answered him, John the Baptist, others, Elijah, still others, one of the prophets, but you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. People in the first century were confused. What they had been taught, what they'd been told, what they were expecting, who was this man? Was he a prophet of God? Was he a good teacher? Was he a good man? Jesus asked this question specifically because how you see Jesus reveals who you believe him to be. And if salvation rests in the finished work of Jesus, the Messiah, this is the most important question that you and I will ever answer in our lives. Reminding him of this reality, I ask him, Dad, who do you say Jesus is? Without hesitation, he said, Michael, he is a Messiah. He is my Savior. With my hand on his shoulder, I told him, then based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to give you the same assurance that Jesus gave the criminal on the cross beside him when he said, truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Our conversation Now finished, he began to rest. With the weight lifted, now peace filled the room because God's grace and God's peace was filling his heart. And you think, well, this could just be anything. But I want to tell you, in the short few hours that he had left, everything, every ounce of his life gave testimony to this fact because he was completely changed from a, a man that wanted what he wanted and liked. He was, he was steadfast in so many ways and he liked what he liked. And he would turn away things that were subpar or substandard. But all of a sudden he started to look at others through a different lens and, and the ladies that were caring for him. He asked if I would go get him something to eat and he said, but will you get them something please? They've been here, they need to be cared for. Will you please bring them something to eat? When I got back with his food, he said, did you, did you get them? Did you take care of them? Please tell me you did, which we will. We were unable to because he was transported. The next day when he was in hospice care, the first words that Heather heard from the nurse, Don had went to one of them or had in conversation said that he was just so grateful that his daughter no longer had to care for him, which she had done so faithfully for so long. Further, 
in his last meals, the chef made him, the cook there on site, made him a chocolate milkshake and a ham and cheese sandwich, which he said were the best that he'd ever had in his life. And he was so grateful to the point, please bring the cook in here so that I can tell him that. So in walks the cook as he shares the message of the best ham and cheese and chocolate milkshake that he's ever had. But God, the two most hopeful words revealed in scripture, the two words that hinge between the problem with humanity, which is sin and the solution, which is Jesus Christ. Sin leading to death and Christ leading to life and salvation. God never stopped loving or pursuing Don's heart. Jesus himself reminds us in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the ones who do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, so many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. See, the reality of the world is that he's rejected. Our churches aren't immune. There's a lot of head knowledge that can fill the pews. Billy Graham uh, even believed that 70% of the churches are filled with unsaved people. That people had put their hope in the wrong things. We live in the Bible Belt and people do things out of tradition. They go to church as families, they, they do church things. But the question really comes down to is, do they know Jesus? The truth. So false gospel is false hopes and salvation. Jesus asked his followers, who do you say I am? And if the word of God really is true, and if salvation really does rest in the finished work of Jesus the Messiah, then this is the most important question we will ever answer. So how you see Jesus reveals to you who you believe him to be. And the cost of not knowing is way too high. So reminding you of this reality, I love you enough to say and to ask, who do you say Jesus is? Don Hess was known as a man of love and loyalty. As a son, brother, husband, father, grandfather, uncle, church member, friend, neighbor, his testimony of faith in the Lord Jesus now leaves behind a legacy of hope. And this is the life and the legacy that we get to celebrate here today. Will you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for this day. God, we praise you for waking us up, for putting breath in our lungs. We thank you for the love and the life that you allowed us to experience in Don. God, we praise you for your precious grace and your mercy. Apart from it, we would have no reason to celebrate. So God, you brought us here, you gathered us here together for this reason. I pray for everyone in the sound of my voice. God, I pray that you will do what only you can do. That you will challenge, that you will convict people, meet them where they are, that you will draw them to you. And God, as we seek an answer, do the work of your spirit, will you move to help us to see your son Jesus as the Messiah and Savior. Lord, we praise you and we give you all the glory for everything we do and everything we say. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Saved a wretch like me. I want.
once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear! The hour I first believed Through many dangers, toils and snares I have already come Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me When we've been there ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise that when we first begun. Let us pray. God of all, your love never ends. When all else fails, you are still God. We pray to you for each other in our need and for all anywhere who mourn with us this day. Almighty God, to those who doubt, give light. To those who are weak, strength. And to all who have sinned, mercy. Keep true in us the love with which we hold one another. In all our ways, we trust you and acknowledge that in all that you have given to us, it is ultimately yours. As first you gave dawn to us, now we give dawn back to you. And we pray together in the way that your son taught to us in saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, would you now receive Don in the arms of your mercy. Raise him up with all your people. Receive us also and raise us to new life in heaven above. Help us so to love and serve you in this world, in all that we do, so that by your grace alone we may enter into your joy, into the world that is to come forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is Blessed Assurance, chosen because of its deep significance to Don's family, and because in this time we not only wanted to share Don's story, but we also wanted to point others towards the wonderful Savior we have in Jesus.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. In honor and recognition of Don's service to our country, I now invite representatives from the U.S. Army to come forward.
hear now the words of our benediction and blessing over each of you. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and mind in the knowledge and love of God and his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came, died, and rose from the dead so that we may be forever with him in the presence of the Holy Spirit, our comfort and our guide, now and forever. Amen. This concludes our service celebrating the life of Don Hess, but as you prepare to go, the family will be standing in the front of the sanctuary to accept your condolences. Please feel free to greet the family and mingle and watch the slideshow of photos from Don's life. We do ask that you do your best to maintain social distancing and continue wearing your mask for the safety of the family and others. Thank you. You may go in peace. Amen.